Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Perso, and I work for the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association and am the New Hampshire Pro Start State Coordinator. Thank you for being here today for this New Hampshire Hospitality Month Goes Virtual event. A big thank you to the American Culinary Federation for bringing us all together and to Chef Beatty for showcasing how knife skills can be used in creative ways using fruits and vegetables. I hope you enjoy this presentation and now to Jackie. Well, thank you, Amy. And thank you to New Hampshire Pro Start for partnering with us today. We heard you wanted a closer look at fruit and vegetable carving skills and ACF listened. Now, more than ever, it's important for culinarians to connect to share and to offer inspiration and mentorship, which is exactly why we're excited to be here today, just for you, the future leaders of the food service industry. Before we begin, as a note, we'll be taking questions from you, the viewers, as we are able. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other viewers and the Q&A function to pose questions for the chef. So let's test it out in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from today. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I am thrilled to be here because my culinary training actually began in a high school program in New Hampshire, like many of you. So I can't wait to get started. I'm going to introduce a friend, a colleague, and a very talented young culinarian who will also be today's moderator. Chef Ashton Garrett is president of the ACF Young Chefs Club, which includes all ACF members under the age of 25. He is also the USA's Young Chef Ambassador to the World Association of Chef Societies and has earned an associate's and bachelor's degree from Johnson Wales University. He is a Pro Start Program alumni and currently works as Senior Culinary Manager at the Marriott Hotel in Cleveland, Ohio. And he's also a recent winner on Guy's Grocery Games on the Food Network. So without further ado, welcome Chef Ashton. And at this point, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you. Jackie, thank you so much. Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. I am elated to be your moderator today. Um, it's, we have a wonderful presentation. I'm very, very excited about this presentation. Um, we have a friend, a colleague, a close mentor and a teacher of mine, um, someone I'm very, very personal with and I'm honored to, that he's here with us today as a featured chef. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Chef Steve Beatty. Uh, chef Stephen Beatty is the founder of Graffiti Carving. Chef has taken home multiple golden, uh, I'm sorry, gold sculpting awards in international and national competitions. Uh, as an artist, he uses the canvas of fruit and vegetables to send a unique message that encourages other culinarians to push boundaries. Chef Steve has been featured on multiple syndicated TV shows such as Food Network. In 2020, Chef Steve traveled to Stuttgart, Germany uh, to represent the United States in the Culinary IKA Olympics, one of the most prestigious culinary competitions in the world, uh, where he brought uh, home and received two diplomas for culinary excellence. Uh, Chef Steve has received numerous medals and awards through the American Culinary Federation, the World Association of Chef Societies, and many other organizations. And we are overjoyed for his presence and for his intellect and knowledge as he will be doing a, a joint presentation. So without further ado, Chef Steve, thank you for being here um, as a friend, as a young chef, as a, as a mentee. It's an honor to see you, man. Um, please tell us what, you, what you're going to be doing today. Yeah, so Ashton, I, I got to tell you and Jackie, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity, obviously, to be here and support, obviously, which is something near and dear to my heart. So um, actually today, I'm just going to show everyone a simple uh, scoop and drop design, which uh, creates the ability to create layers uh, of uh, petals, which looks more realistic and three-dimensional, but it just uh, shows the ability to be uh, kind of out of the box thinking when it comes to setting up different garmage and um, also platforms and platters and things of that nature. So at the end of the day, it, it separates you from uh, other potential uh, culinarians that are uh, applying for jobs and different things like that. So these little skills that I've had the ability to develop over the years has definitely given me an edge. So I'm gonna just uh, flip the camera around. I have a simple honeydew melon and it's one of those things that uh, I enjoy doing and the clients love to brag about. So. Uh, if you're like me, I love when my guests and my clients get the camera out uh, when I put a presentation out. So uh, I'm really excited about the opportunity. So I'm going to flip it around. I'm going to show you some of the tools that I use and uh, kind of my setup when it comes for uh, being a creative mind. All right. Let's do it, Chef. All right. So, 
so kind of what you um what, what my setup is is that uh believe it or not this is a floor drain that i got from home depot so um i know uh Ashley, you teach a lot. Uh, I know to young culinarians about uh, making sure something is flat. And so it's the same principle that applies to carving is that I don't want this melon kind of rolling around and moving. So I, uh, I use uh, apparatus like this that allows me to kind of contort and to move my melon around. So uh, which is important. The other thing is I use is I have a custom made like a, kind of a lazy Susie, which allows me to move uh my uh whatever my medium is around you know so this is a great thing for fatigue i uh, always have a little side uh, board for taking it off and doing small pieces um but then believe it or not people believe that i have a lot of tools so to speak but um this is a tie knife it's kind of a cross between a paring knife and a fillet knife so it's extremely flexible all right and it's extremely sharp um, I sharpen it with sandpaper. Um, people ask me, you know, how do I keep my carving knife so sharp? I use sandpaper, believe it or not. And I use different versions of uh, grits. So the higher the grit of sandpaper, the finer it is, the better off your edge is going to be. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so that's that. Um, obviously, I use a traditional uh, paring knife. Um, and then uh, I use a protractor. So um, this gets allows me to have perfect circles. Um, I'm not going to use it today because of the scoop design that I'm doing, but um, if you want, ever wanted to plot out, you know, uh, a carving or a, a design, that's what you would do. So you can see how just turning my um, lazy Susie, Susan or my turntable, how easy it was just to kind of maneuver. So I would do that and move this piece along different parts of the melon and kind of score it and bruise the skin. So but today I'm going to show you guys just um, how it is about holding your knife, um, anchoring your cuts and making relief cuts. So once you, uh, you get this principle down, the sky is the limit uh, when it comes to designing fruits uh, and vegetables and things of that nature. At, uh, at the end of the day, you just have to uh, commit a certain amount of time to it. So in my world, it's extremely busy. So I usually try not to go over 20 minutes or so on a melon carving. So um, a lot of times I start at the center and um, I work my way out. So today's design is literally, I'm making a cone um, relief. So um, I just took a little piece out like that. And so I usually work in odd numbers because odd numbers, you're able to um, cascade the petals a little bit cleaner. So if you do even numbers, you'll find that you're gonna, they're gonna eventually, you're gonna run out of space and they're gonna run into each other. Where odd numbers, you tend to open up and it tends to bloom, so to speak. So <clears throat> as you can see, there's a real quick scoop design like this. I just did five scoops. And what's gonna happen um, is that I noticed like, ah, uh, this one is a little bit more shallow than the rest. So, I'm just gonna go back inside of here and open that up a little bit more. All right, so the key to making a, a great carving design is to be able to create shadows. The shadows comes with depth. And a lot of uh, entry-level carvers, they're afraid to cut away. So don't be afraid to push the design back. It's the same thing with ice carving. You wanna push it back as much as possible to be able to show what you're doing, all right? So um, with that being said, um, you wanna keep your cuts thin like that and so we're going to do the same thing over here and up and like anything uh that's pairing knife related you want to make sure that you're using the uh the tip of your knife as much as possible because that's when you're able to get those really nice sharp cuts um the other thing i tell people is when you're choosing a fruit and vegetable to be your medium or your muse just make sure that the fruit or vegetable is a little bit underripe because um, you want nice crisp lines. Now, if that fruit or vegetable is very ripe, it's going to be soft and it's going to be a little spongy, so to speak. So um, you saw what I did is that I just traced those cuts. And now what I'm doing now is I'm going underneath those cuts. So I just went underneath that cut, boom. And I'm doing the exact same 
drag and drop design. All right, we're gonna go underneath these petals that we just did right here. All right, that same scoop design, literally you're making a U. And then I'm gonna go on the inside of that cut and I'm, I'm just gonna trace it out and I'm gonna drop it. I'm scooping again, make a U. And that's that uh, relief cut I was talking about. When your uh, cuts connect, it allows your, your cut or your design to be relieved without tearing it. A lot of times I see uh, beginners, they get so frustrated because their, their uh, design tears or it rips or whatever the case might be. It's just, you gotta make sure your cuts connect. And so that'll relieve some of the frustration. So, which is key. So <clears throat> we got one more uh, pedal to drop in here real quick like that and then I'm just going to drag it out once again and so as you guys can see I'm just alternating going back and forth and working in this odd numbers allowing it to cascade really nicely so um, so what I'm going to do now is uh once again I'm going to start on the opposite side again and do a scoop and we're gonna do this all the way down. So I'm gonna show you um, something that you guys could do if you have one of these kits. So a lot of times what I do is to save myself time is that I do one cut all the way around. I do all my scoop cut designs all the way around like this. And then I'll come back through. And I'm able to do the rest. But then um, I have a, a little tool here, which is called a U gauge, and they have V's and U's chisels. And for instance, this one just creates a little um, hole. And it's just about, once again, creating shadows. So whenever you create these shadows, it allows light to kind of penetrate it and creates another design. <clears throat> So then I'm gonna come back through on the inside of that cut. I'm just gonna drag and drop it. And so it's a, a kind of a step and repeat action like anything else in the kitchen, whether you're breading or um, you're sauteing or grilling, you're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. And once you get to a certain point, uh, you're gonna be able to uh, show a beautiful design. So. Uh, like I said, we're going to keep going. And as you uh, get uh, further outside of the melon, you'll find that uh, you're going to make your cuts a little bit bigger. They're not going to be as shallow. Um, they're going to be a little bit bigger. Because um, you, if you look at petals in nature, they get bigger as you get to the outside. So I'm going to make these cuts a little bit more deep, more intense, a little bit more wide to make sure that I'm uh, cascading these correctly. So, because if I stayed real small, what you will find is, is that uh, it would look natural. It would look organic, all right? So um, I'm gonna alternate between adding some of the um, designs with the u gauge to just doing regular petals. And so, as you guys can see, and you young chefs can see, like I said, it just comes together really quickly. So this is what I was talking about, the advantage of having like a vessel. I was able to tilt it on the side like that to be able to get a better angle. So it wouldn't feel awkward. So just be able to do it like that. And as you can see, I'm letting this um, lazy Susie slash um, turntable do a lot of the work for me. Um, I'm just kind of spinning it as I'm cutting. And you can see how far my knife is going in. It's uh, deep enough, because like I said, I want to make sure I get those nice deep relief cuts. All right. So I'm gonna come back in with my U tool and 
this time I'm going to do two. So just one. I got to hit on myself. So what we've got to take out here. There we go. So hey, Chef. I'm going to do two. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Ashton. All right, my well, man. Uh, so, so you spoke about, you know, uh, I'm going to interject. I, I'm going to get, get right no, back. No, you're fine. I'm just mesmerized with, the, with always about your, your culinary technique. Um, so you spoke about, you know, choosing different fruits, right? So can you speak a little bit about that? You know, like how how can you discern, right, the ripen of a melon or, you know, a cantaloupe or anything like that? You know, everybody's, you know, there's myths and there's techniques. You know, my uh, I kind of came up. On the old school, you know, you got to slap the or, or not on the, <laughs> on the watermelon in here if it's hollow or anything like that. So for you, you know, in, in terms of being an expert and, and working with fruits all your life, presumably. Right. So how is it for you? you know, how, how do you go to the market and, and choose certain fruits? Um, I go a lot of times by smell. Um, a lot of times if something is right, um, you can smell it. I mean, it's a muskmelon smells real musty. Watermelon smell real sweet. Um, but then also, then you go to your uh, sense of touch. And so then I always go to the uh, root end and I, and I press in on it. And obviously, if the root end goes completely in without very uh, little resistance, um, you're going to find out that it might be a chance that it's overripe. All right. right? But then also the second piece is um, I literally, you know, you could tell just by touching it, you know, and I go in here and I start to fill around. And I, I begin to put pressure on it. And I'm like, it's good. It's not caving in. I'm like, okay, this is good. So that's what I do, you know, between sense of smell and just touching, you know, getting in there and actually just kind of handling, you know, whatever the, the, your uh, medium is, you'll find out that you're going to get the desired end that you want. Does color have anything to do with that, Chef? Um, so some of it does. But, you know, you got to remember that there's different um, hybrids and heirlooms when it comes to fruit. So, uh, I so i.e. you'll you'll see that like a sweet baby uh, melon, the skin tends tends to be a lot darker. If you look at a seedless watermelon, the skin tends to be a light lighter, and if it is a seeded, more oblong, those seem to really have those nice tiger stripes. You know, They're, they have a very pronounced like watermelon look to them. So a lot of times it's just kind of looking at the the uh, breed, so to speak, of the melon. And that a lot of times you'll kind of just tell by the color of it if it's ready to go. And Chef, uh, to your point, have you had more difficulty with, you know, fruits that have seeds in terms of carving? Like, do you have to carve around them? Is there a special, special method that you have to, you know, kind of, uh, I wish I say, you know, enact, if you will, for, for seed? Um, yeah, fruit? man. So that's a great question. So a lot of times, it, that is going to determine your design. So if something right. has a lot of seed pockets, you, um, you're going to be very limited on how far you can push that medium back. So for instance, uh, a butternut squash, the top of it is, uh, is seedless, okay? For sure. um, but obviously you got the, a seed pocket that's in the bottom. So a lot of times when I'm doing uh, birds or I'm doing wings or something like that, and I need to be able to push that back as far as I can, I'm going and I'm doing that at the top. Now, when I'm going working towards the bottom, I'm keeping a more simple design. I'm not going to push it as far as back because you have that seed pocket. And so with that seed pocket being, uh, I'm being aware of that, that's once again, it's going to determine how far I'm going to push that design back. That's an interesting point you made, Chef, about the butternut squash, right? You know, dealing with that, I remember my first time with butternut squash and I was in, in uh, high school, you know, my freshman year in class and kind of got down to the bottom of it. Like there's nothing <laughs> in, 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 you know, in the pocket. I'm like, how am I supposed to cut through this? And as you know, you know, butternut squash is a very hard, has a very hard skin, a very tough skin. So um, to carve that is is tremendous. And yep. Chef, we, we, uh, we do have a, a question about your tools, right? So you, you mentioned the protractor, you mentioned the paring knife, you know, kind of like things that, that we all can find in a, in a store. So for other tools, the basic tool, the carving tool that you're using right now, are those readily available? Um, Amazon, like, like how, how can we obtain those? Yeah, definitely. So uh, Amazon is, uh, has come a long way. And it used to be when I first started carving is that you, you didn't have access to these type of things. And so... I remember just trying to uh, having to get things go through customs 
Like it was insane what it took to be able to get uh, a paring knife that was a, a tie knife. Well, that's not the case. So literally you can go on Amazon and type in tie knife and you know, you can get a tie knife in two days. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. With Amazon so, Prime, you can get anything very, very quickly. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely. And you're going to save yourself a lot of money. And so um, I, you could even go to some um, ethnic um, grocery stores and they sell them. They also sell them. But generally speaking, uh, Ashton, I literally just, uh, I use my, my tie pairing knife. I don't use a whole lot of different tools. Right. Um, Dick Alfred, um, who's, a, a, who's my a mentor when it comes to fruit and vegetable carving, um, he says, if you can't learn to make the shape with uh, the knife you have in your hand, you don't need to be doing it. And wow. so um, that's why, as you can see, uh, I switched over uh, the design and I'm using just the tie knife just to create those holes that you were, uh, you were seeing me use a tool for. And I was like, and it's just, I go autopilot. So a lot of times I'm trying to show um, culinarians different tools that they can use, but automatically I switch over just to doing the, uh, the design freehand. So definitely always uh, admonish young culinarians who are interested in fruit and vegetable carving to take the time to learn how to just to do it also with the same knife you have in your hand. Because when you're doing competitions, you got to set that knife down. You got to pick another knife up. Exactly. Um, that's time that's wasted. Right. So you really want to be focusing on your, your design and your art. And you mentioned, Chef, you mentioned, um, you know, your mentor, right? You know, it's something that you explained to me as well, you know, with you being my mentor um, and how important the value of mentorship is, especially with in our profession, dealing with craftsmanship and skillsmanship. Um, so I, I, I like for you to go into that a little bit more, you know, kind of it's always interesting. You know, I love your background story. And so if you could just provide, you know, you don't have to go full in depth, but um, probably the, those couple stories on your early onset that you told me and, and just how you kind of got into carving in the, in the first place, I think the audience would really enjoy it. So uh, I started carving um, simply because I was trying to give myself a knack and um, I was trying to separate myself from the rest of the pack. And um, I'm a self-taught carver, so many times people see the uh, the accolades and they see a lot of the awards and they wonder what kind of schooling I had. But literally, I had a mentor, Chef Alfred, you know, uh, out of Akron, Ohio, and um, and I just practice, I practice, I practice, I practice. Well, it this ability to carve fruit and vegetables is how I got my first culinary job as a, a lead chef. Right. And so I actually used a, a a pumpkin carving kit with the saw. And I was poking holes in a watermelon and it was, it was all bad. The first few designs that I ever did, you know, early in my career were really bad, but eventually I got the hang of it. But, but you fast forward and I've had the ability to definitely uh, mentor a lot of chefs, especially young chefs about uh, self-worth, obviously in the industry and creating a niche for yourself, which is more important than anything else is that what are you going to be known for? And so I believe in paying it forward. Um, I believe in definitely pulling people, you know, up because, you know, I've had some great opportunities. And I remember uh, even with yourself, Ashton, that you called me, you know, when you first got that call from the Food Network about going out and it was like, um, I was able to say, yo, I've been there. Let me tell you, you know, what to look out for and what to do. So it's been great, you know, and, and obviously you've taken the lead, you know, and, and mentor a number of chefs, you know, yourself. So I believe in mentoring is critical to our industry, especially now because, every restaurant that you go into, they, they said that they're understaffed. Right. So I think that's why it's so important to mentor. Thank you for that, Chef. No, it's 100% uh, accurate. Everything you said, I, I, st I still stay true with, with a lot of the things and the values and the morals that you've taught me. So I really appreciate your mentorship. Um, so before we get back into, you know, your demonstration, Chef, we do have a, a very interesting question. Um, that I asked you uh, when you first did your demonstration at Mount Union. So how do you mm -hmm. save your food waste when carving? So let, let's talk about the food waste that you, that you probably accumulate a lot of uh, when, when fruit carving or vegetable carving as well. Yeah, so um, the, the kind of uh, the interesting thing is for uh, down here in South Carolina, you have a lot of local farms and different things of that nature. So we actually work with uh, farmers, but we also work with the school because I work on a campus. 
um, that, that when they're doing different studies and they're doing compost and things of that nature is that we save all of the food scraps and we save all of our uh, leftovers that are um, that will uh, break down and degrade naturally and we're able to, uh, to give them out to the farmers and also to different study groups that are trying to do th different things so um, people go oh wow that makes sense but I think it's important to be uh, responsible because like you said I do create a lot of waste because I practice a lot but also at the end of the day um, I, I enjoy eating fruits and vegetables so it's really nice <laughs> to be able to uh, get a nice little snack so uh, and nothing really goes to waste too often, especially if you're uh, working in the industry, you're able just to kind of repurpose it. So yeah, that is a great question. People ask me that a lot, but um, I think just being responsible is key. Absolutely, Chef. And, and you know, as we transcend more into a more sustainable industry, right, you know, I think that that points to your point again, that, you know, we need to be responsible and be mindful of the waste and, and how we can recycle that back into our earth and, and back into our planet. Uh, Chef, we're getting a lot of comments about how beautiful <laughs> this fruit is. It's crazy to think like just 20 minutes ago, you were starting with that first little carving and, and now look. So uh, can you explain what you're doing right now? Yeah, so um it's a, I tell people about, it's a step and repeat. It's about being able to do the same technique over and over. And so literally in that time, as everyone has seen, I just been offsetting, you know, I come here, then I come here and you kind of go back and forth. And like I said, this, if you looked at a flower, this is very organic, it's very natural. And so what I like to do is um, I never really do designs this simple all the time, but I like to incorporate different techniques. So obviously just by adding a shadow here and then it's with the scoop and drop and then you add two more here and then you do three here and then you just kind of do a jagged design and then you do something a little avant-garde which kind of rolls off the knife. And so you literally curling your knife to the center of the product and you kind of go on back and forth. And so I love to, uh, for my clients, especially that hire me to do this, is that I would like from the study the piece because it truly is, is a work of art, you know? So I like to whatever I'm doing to let it to be a work of art that they don't get bored with. And so that's why you'll see me, I'll usually do about four to five different techniques in one melon because I want people to actually to sit there and actually enjoy it and admire whatever I'm doing. And so um, the other uh, tip that, you know, I, I guess I want to drop real quick is that um, don't be afraid to incorporate the skin. Mm. So you can see on the tips, it, I always left the skin on there because it adds a little highlight to it. And so I know a lot of people completely um, shave their melon down and then they'll carve it. Well, I try to, then I go back and try to tell them like, yo, you just left, lost a valuable opportunity to be able to just highlight just the skin of it. And so just leave the skin on there, just like that and work around it, um, which is nice for me. That's like I said, another little nice little tip I like to do, especially with competitions, because it adds a nice flow to it also, because it draws your eyes in. Oh, so that's beautiful. I have seen your work firsthand. I, I can attest <laughs> to the audience that this, um, Dude, this camera does not do him justice or, or his work. It's <laughs> truly, truly beautiful. Absolutely. Chef, I, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, we have a question from the audience from Chef Emma, young Chef Emma. Uh, she asked, do you get a better definition with a harder fruit or vegetable uh, like the butternut squash? And then uh, I'll follow up with another question after that. Yeah, so um, I think if you're doing, uh, if you have the time to commit um, to doing a, a more dense more uh, rigid uh, vegetable or fruit like that, absolutely. You're gonna, your lines are gonna be a little bit more pronounced, um, but you gotta also make sure that your tools are on point and they're as sharp as can be because right. you're gonna find yourself adding a lot more pressure to uh, actually get those cuts. Where something like this was, uh, that's more water uh, dense, like a, a piece of fruit, you're gonna find that your knife kind of flows through it a little bit easier. So um, that's a great question. And, um, and to that point, yeah, definitely, you're gonna get a lot more definition. That's why you're able to, I would very rarely ever do a face in like a cantaloupe or a honeydew, but you'll see me do a face in a, 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 a pumpkin or anything of the gourd family like that. So For sure. definitely. 
So yep. there's, there's a, a lot more strategy going into play for those harder, more de more defined uh, vegetables and fruits, correct? Correct. Right. No, yeah, that's that's very important, Chef. Thank you. Uh, Chef Elijah um, has a uh, a comment and a question. So he says uh, a lot of sculptors, yeah. a lot of uh, sculptors say that they uh, excuse me, a lot of sculptors say they just removed what wasn't needed, uh, just in terms of the waste, and uh, statues reveal themselves. Um, is, is mm -hmm. that kind of the same way for you in terms of what you, like your processes or your values in terms of when you approach your sculpting? Um, definitely. I, I, I think uh, the other piece would be is that um, you, you'll hear me talk about it also is that your waste is going to be determined by how much definition you're trying to produce. And so uh, I'm going to flip this over. And you can see I'm almost getting to the, um, the root of it and how far I push this fruit back just to get levels back right. into it. So um, if I would have stayed very shallow and extremely precise, I probably wouldn't have very much waste at all. But at the end of the day, it's about how much definition you're trying to produce. And so I'm always trying to get the most out of it that I possibly can. So I'll, I'll tend to accumulate a little bit more waste. Um, that's why I'm kind of keeping track of it over here. Um, and also in a competition world, uh, they check your waist to yes, see. They, do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they check they your waist to see, you know, what's in there and if if it's actually lining up. So um, they'll look at your design and saying, "Oh wow, you cut away way too much product only to get that one petal." So they want to know that you know you're skilled and you have forethought in what you're doing. And so I was really surprised when I was in Germany that they gave me a clear waist bag. And, they, and that's what they did. They walked around and they looked at it. They want to know how much waste you had compared to your design. And that's the interesting point, Chef. Um, and actually, that's something that I'm hearing for the very first time about the clear waste bag is while you were in Germany, you know, I, I was blessed enough to do my, my Italy competition at the same time. And we had the exact same parameters with the clear bag so that they could see our waste with the garmange component as well. So, um, and would you consider your, your craftsmanship to be like kind of that garmange, um, calling it, you know, avant-garde kind of style? Definitely. And I, I think it's one of those things where, um, it's 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 making a comeback. I think that um, when it comes to garmage, even doing uh, cold food presented hot, um, doing more pâtés, doing ballotines and galantines, that whole uh, mantra is kind of making a comeback. Where I think you know before it was revered a little bit more that whether you could sculpt food and you had these beautiful elaborate platters and presentation. Where I think. People are in such a rush that they've kind of gotten away from it, but I think it's making a great comeback. And I think the ability to bring food and also the uh, presentation of fruits and vegetables and other mediums, even like ice, is definitely on a comeback. Because if you even go to Thailand um, and you're a guest in someone's home, they carve you a piece of fruit. Like it's wow. one of those things that is re it's just revered, and um, that's why it's so important that. They even teach fruit and vegetable carving in schools because it's definitely a way of showing and showcasing that I welcome you. And right. it's uh, definitely showing a level of appreciation. That's tremendous, Chef. That looks beautiful, as always. Uh, so, Chef, we have about 20, 25 minutes left. Um, I'm just going to keep asking you some questions and um, feel free to just, if you have interject and want to talk about more about your food carving, I'm sure the audience would love it. Uh, we're just getting a lot of great feedback and, and questions. So I want to try to get as many as possible. How does that sound? Yep. Absolutely. Wonderful. So uh, from Chef Chris, I'm going to add, um, kind of add both questions in, into this question I'm going to ask you. So first is, uh, what produce do you stay away from from carving? Um, and, and what is the best temperature for produce to carve? Um, and kind of to that first question, I ask you, uh, what is the best for beginners to carve? What, what fruits and vegetables? Oh, man. So um, so uh, I'm just going uh, to, before I answer that, I, I tell people um, when I do competitions, they ask me about how do you keep fruits uh, fresh and vegetables fresh? Uh, one of the best things is water. Right. I know a lot of people come up with some schemes and chemicals and whatever. Um, water naturally reacts to fruits and vegetables. They absorb it and it adds a nice shine to it and a nice sheen. And um, so if I'm doing a competition, I do these up uh, three to five days in advance. I wrap them in wet paper towels and I change those paper towels every day 
and put fresh tiles on. If I got radishes or something like I'm about to carve now, um, I would um, change that water out daily because you'll, it gets very musty and uh, it gets stank and it'll begin to break down. Uh, naturally, that's what fruits and vegetables do. Sure. Um, but so the, I, as far as vegetables to stay away from, uh, I, I'll, I'll come back to it like oranges, lemons, um, things like that. They're very hard to carve. They're very uh, difficult to get definition on. So more, um, more citrus fruits? Yeah, yeah, right. they're very difficult. You'll find that you're going to get some very simple designs. And with that being said, I tell people to start with those because you, you'll you get comfortable because they don't require a lot of pressure. And also your designs are very entry level. And then from there, I tell people um, to work on what I'm about to show you now, which is um, uh, radishes and uh potatoes and turnips and different things of that nature because um, they get, they're a little bit more dense. So you learn muscle memory and how to use some pressure. For sure. So, so um, what we're about to do now is like I said, we're about to flip over to this carving a, a watermelon a radish and we're gonna carve it into a rose. And so I think that'll take us to do the rest of our, our demo. But more importantly, like I said, it's just gonna show your ability just to add colors and textures. So um, it's the same principle. Um, you wanna be able to um, work in odd numbers. So, which is really important. So you're gonna, when I do these petals, I'm gonna, uh, uh, same principle as far as the relief cut. All right. So naturally uh, you, petals are concave and they're, uh, it's gonna be more of a, uh, upside down U, more of a C, upside down C, all right? So you'll find that naturally when you make a cut, it's gonna make that for you. So the, the key to this is that I tell people is um, you don't wanna cut all the way through, obviously, but you don't wanna cut north and south as far as it being 90 degrees. So naturally, Fruits and vegetables, they kind of have a, um, uh, they, they curve. And you want to follow that natural curve, all right? And once you do that correctly, and you want to find that it begins to anchor in there really nice. And this cut is not very thick, and nor is it very, um, the girth of it is not there. And you can see how it's beginning to curl back already. And that's what you want to be able to do. Because if your cut was too thick, it has snap right off, all right? You're not gonna get very good definition. You can see that petal is already starting to drop already, which is gonna be nice. And so when I do my roses is that where my cut ends is that I wanna make sure that's where those two cuts meet. And so my cuts, generally speaking, they're gonna overlap a little bit, which is okay. And you get this little V. And I wanna make sure everyone sees that. You wanna make sure you get that little V when you're doing a rose, something like that, because that's when you know that your cuts are gonna be able to come out right. And as you can see, you just kind of roll that back and you can see that it's starting to create that rose design already. So we're just gonna keep going. That's number three. And it's Chef, could you use a, uh, like a tournée knife or an alternative knife for this? Or is this a paring knife usually the more standard knife? Correct. Okay. Um, I, you know what, someone just popped in and uh, it went away really quickly and I'm glad they said it, is that it's about making sure that um, your fruits and vegetables are at room temperature. Um, right. I can't say that enough. That is a great point. I don't know who made that point, but uh, I like you. Uh, I want to say thank you for interjecting on that because uh, if they're cold, they crack and they splinter. Um, where you find that when uh, it kind of relaxes, the, it's the best way to describe it it relaxes it and uh, whatever your medium is. So make sure that you do that. So um, five cuts all the way around, not very deep, all right? They overlap slightly, all right, which is key. So now, because you went out at a slight angle, when you do your relief cut, now this is literally gonna be 90 degrees. Oh, Chef Dewey, man, that is the, I, listen, Chef Dewey is uh, a patriarch. He is like, uh, he's that guy who I got to say, I'm going to say publicly thank you for, um, he has sent me like private messages without me even asking, dropping knowledge. And wow. so he, he is, 
Chef Ray Dewey, he, he's like the godfather when it comes to fruit and vegetable carving. Um, I, I got to, once again, I got to say publicly say thank you because this man has, even though we have never met before face to face over a period of probably 10 years, this guy has always sent me um, uh, criticism, let's be honest, and told me ways I could be better. But I was mature enough, and I can't say this enough of you being mentored by someone, is that you got to be mature enough uh, to accept sometimes when people are saying, hey, there's a better way to do it. Sure. And so uh, Chef has always been able to drop jewels in my inbox or even call him. I mean, he has my cell phone number. He's, he's also called. So thanks, Chef. So the next thing is that because petals are natural, we, we, we talk about going uh, from uh, that cascading point and going in between those two. So those petals that I just carved, um, and I left the skid on purpose, we talked about the, the, the contrast. We're gonna go right back in at an angle and we're gonna make another set of, of petals. And I'm gonna overlap slightly and we're gonna do this five times, just like we just did, all right? And once those petals meet, um, you'll see that uh, they're just there and they're in there really nice and they uh, fold back. And then you make your relief cut again. So some people, they go all the way around when they make the relief cut. Uh, when I get into delicate things like that, I do my relief cut one petal at a time because I want to make, I want to check my angles to make sure they're right, all right? And so I'll go underneath those and I've changed my angle once again to do that relief cut. And I take a little bit off at a time just to make sure that my cuts are where they need to be. All right, so you guys can see right now underneath that these petals are starting to kind of come in here really nice. And we're gonna keep going. All right, so once I get to a certain point though, um, we're actually gonna flip our angle And we're gonna uh, angle our knife more towards the center because we want this to be an unbloomed rose. So you'll find that by doing that, make sure that's there, that's there, that's there, that those petals are really nice and tight. So I can't say it enough. We're not taking off a whole lot, but you guys can see the petals coming in there. Um, and this is once again, where you learn, like I said, your relief cuts and those cuts literally coming together. That's more important than anything. And Chef, if you wouldn't mind uh, just reiterating, uh, what exactly is the relief cut in terms of definition? Yep, so the relief cut is the cut that comes together. So um, you spent all this time creating a petal. So the relief cut is the cut that releases the petal. So that cut that was in front of the petal that's the relief cut. So I made that, that cut at an angle, then I came in front of it at that 90 degree angle and I cut away that flesh to show the petal. So it doesn't do you any good if you're, you're doing these beautiful carvings and you're making these petals if no one can see it. So that relief cut allows it to come kind of come forward. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so at this point, I'm going to bottom this out. And so I usually always keep a bin that for salad bar, believe it or not, or soups. So like a, something like this um, goes right to the salad bar and I will always keep my scraps separate. Always, I, I'm very intentional about that when it comes to we talk about waste and food costs and stuff, that this is, you know, good meat. So I'm gonna set this aside and, you know, we could incorporate that into a salad or uh, something of that nature. But um, at this point, uh, I'm going to round off my corner here, and um, I can't say enough about um, rounding, is that those sharp edges are going to be very jagged. It's not going to have a very uh, smooth design. So when you're making flowers and roses more than anything else, um, you want to round off that top as much as you can. And you'll see why in a second. So I don't know if you guys could, you know, you could obviously see it, but these petals, how they just kind of alternate in, obviously. But then, you know, when it comes to the center, I did shave it back enough that it's going to be able to look like, once again, naturally a flower is going to be on the inside. 
So you gotta, you're gonna have to learn a little bit about, um, was it botany? Is that, is that what it is? What it talks about flowers? Uh, yes, and, uh, I, I think I think that's correct, Seth. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, you have to learn a little bit about that when it comes to like uh, florals and different things like that. Naturally, what a piston looks like, or, or or anything like that, because you know, once again, you want it to be as uh, close to resil uh, resembling what it is. So, which is very key. And when you're doing competitions. Um, they want to know, is it a whimsical design or is it a realistic design? Because if you're doing a, a whimsical flower, okay. But if you're saying it's a realistic rose and obviously it look, doesn't look like a rose, you're going to get points taken off for that. So um, as you guys can see, I rounded this out pretty good. I'm going to go back in and usually I would slow it down and clean it up a bit, but I want to make sure I get be able to get this clean cleaned up and uh, done before our presentation is over. But <clears throat> so right now uh, I'm going to go in between these two petals, same technique, and I'm going to begin to uh, carve towards. Now my knife is going to go a little bit deeper on this because I got a lot of meat to work with. So I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to come only do halfway. Now a lot of my cuts. I did the full relief cut from um, the beginning to the end, but this, because I want these petals to kind of intersect, I'm gonna start in the middle of it. And I'm gonna take just a little bit of flesh off, all right? Then I'm gonna start in the middle of that petal and then I make another one, all right? Then I go come back to the middle. I do that relief cut, which once again, where I talked about allowing that uh, petal to kind of show forward. And then I make that the cut, carve another petal. All right, go into the middle, slight angle, relief cut, take it out, start back in that middle, make another petal, all right? Middle of it, relief cut. I, I can't say enough about it being a step and repeat. It's the same thing over and over. You come back, you make your petal, all right? Come back in the middle, shave it down, and these two connect, and then you're gonna make one more petal, all right? So when these connect, you got the center rose right there, all right? So this is when you make one large relief cut because you want it to be layered in. And I can't say this is enough, is that learning how to hold your knife. This is why I talk about um, being a beginner is learning how to hold your knife like a pencil. All right. How do you prevent uh, from safety? So uh, I, I got a safety <laughs> question, Ashton, is that oh, I know some people, um, they, they're concerned about cutting themselves. I say, you know, feel free to put a cut glove on his hand right. in case you do slip and you poke yourself. Um, I, I can't say this enough is that a sharp knife is going to be your best friend. So if your knife is dull, it's going to require a lot more force and pressure and you're trying to get in there and you're going to slip, you know, so I can't say it enough. Make sure your knife is sharp and be safe. And, um, once again, get those angles, right? If you hold it once again, like a pencil like this, I try not to leave so much of the blade exposed that it's going to be able to cut me. But I, obviously, you know, I've been carving this for a number of years now, so I feel a little bit more comfortable with the knife. So as you guys can see, this kind of rose is really coming together. Um, this being layered, the contrast in colors, which is nice. And then um, I'm going to kind of stand my knife up a little bit instead of being so uh, concave that I could be able to get some more definition in here. And this is where, you know, the uh, finesse of carving comes into play. This is why I tell people to master the, the rose because you have to learn how to hold that knife, get your cuts to meet, use the tip of your knife and kind of just bring it all together. And I'm not really cutting away a lot of flesh just to be able to create these petals, but 
I'm cutting enough away just to kind of show enough of it to make sure that, you know, the definition is there. So I'm gonna kind of stop right here because um, I could spend all day just bumping this rose <laughs> down, you know, and once again, like I said, just getting petals in there. So I wanna, I'm gonna show you something that just happened, which I couldn't plan on is that um, like radishes, they have these little spots in them that um, right there. So that lets me know I need to stop because we talked oh. about like the, uh, the butternut squash. Right. This, this told me to stop. Don't carve anymore because it's gonna fall apart. So now you're listening to your fruits and vegetables. Exactly. Right. So that, that, that literally just told me, don't carve anymore, Steve, it's gonna fall apart. Wow. Chef, we have about uh, 10 minutes left in this presentation. Uh, I, I think I, I hopefully speak for the rest of the audience. This was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I'm gonna go to the Q and A and just probably tackle yeah. about two real shortly before I pass it back to Jackie. Uh, yes. So we have a, a question um, from Chef Natalie um, and then we'll, we'll go to Chef Daniel. That will be our, our last question. Uh, do you ever use color uh, from or, or food coloring or for one or from beet or carrot juice to add uh, some sort of depth so basically, you know, do you add any, any color enhancing flavors? Oh, that's a great question. So um, I'm going to address that twofold. <laughs> so um, typically, if I'm going for color on my design, um, if the color isn't organic, I typically don't add it now. But if I'm going for a particular look, let's say the tips of the wings of a bird, and I want to do a bird of paradise, and I want to brush the, brush the edges with that beat so that the, uh, the edges are really nice and bright red by all means. But typically when I'm doing a design for a competition, I've already looked at colors. Right. And I, for instance, I already know that if I'm gonna do a display, I'm gonna do a cantaloupe, which is orange, a honeydew, which is green. I'm gonna do some roses out of a watermelon radish. That's gonna give you that nice magenta color with some of the green on the skin. I know I'm gonna incorporate some yellow squash. So whenever I'm doing a piece, I'm already picking fruits and vegetables that are gonna give me color. So it almost kind of defeats the purpose, you know, unless you're just, you don't have access to a whole lot and you need to cross over and by all means, you know, if you do a turn up, brush the top with beets right. because that's all you have. By all means, go for it. Thank you for that, Chef. Um, I think we will do uh, one last question uh, from Chef Daniel. Um, so, Chef, uh, what uh, what culinary school program did you attend, uh, in which you know you learned the craftsmanship of culinary arts, and uh, for how long did it take you to actually get a hang of what you're doing now? Um, and then uh, do, you do, do you do ice carving as well? Look, that's a great question. So I went to culinary school in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania Culinary back in 1998. So that's a couple of moons ago. But then uh, uh, also, let me flip this around so I can see everybody instead of you guys having to stare at a... Uh, um, so, and then, um, wow, that was almost a long time ago, 20 years plus 20 years plus, wow, I feel old. But- um, Nobody has to know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 don't, I can't say that I have a, got a, a hang of it yet. You know, the great thing about culinary arts is it's always something to learn. It's always a, a work in, in progress. And so I'm grateful for, to be able to be a student of the game for so long. So I don't know, I'm still figuring it out. I got some cool parts of my uh, culinary career that I can show off, but uh, all in all, I'm still learning and I'm enjoying the ride. Definitely. Chef, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, for, for the viewers, um, where might they be able to find you, Chef? Definitely. So if you look on any social media um, handle, uh, Stephen C. Beatty, spelled S-T-E-P-H-A-N-C-B-A-I-T-Y. Give me a follow. I'll follow you back. Um, don't I answer personally inboxes. So if you have a question about something, send me an inbox. Uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can if I'm not traveling or doing whatever you know I got going on. But I'll definitely always try to make sure that I respond. Chef Steve, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. Uh, to other viewers who uh, watched this specific presentation, thank you for joining us. 
uh, as a friend, a young mentor, excuse me, a young mentee, a student of you, Chef, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and learn from you. Uh, I learned something all, all the time watching. So thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Ashton. Absolutely. And now, now we're going to pass it back to Jackie uh, for our closing remarks. So thank Jackie. Well, thank you, Ashton, and thank you, Chef Beatty. You make it look so easy, but we know you have thousands and thousands of hours of carving practice. So any of the young chefs who are tuning in today, please keep at it. Um, and as Chef said, um, follow him on social media uh, and find yourself a mentor. I think that's a great takeaway from the discussion as well. So a huge virtual round of applause as we thank Chef Beatty and uh, thank you for moderating Chef Ashton. We appreciate both of you taking the time to be here with all of us today live. So ACF is listening. Please let us know what you'd like to see next. Um, we will have our next Chef's Forum webinar on April 28th, where you will be able to learn what the buzz is all about. We're in for a real treat as Master Chef Joseph Leonardi from the Country Club in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts will present Cooking with Liquid Gold uh, presentation and demo. So don't miss out. You can register for that on wearechefs.com and just look up the webinars. On behalf of the ACF and the ACF National Office, thank you to New Hampshire ProStart for partnering with us today and for the opportunity and thank all of you for tuning in. Please save the date. We'd love to see you all at ACF National Convention, which will be held live August 2nd through 5th in Orlando. So thank you all again. We'll see you real soon. Hello everyone, welcome to the beautiful World Center Marriott here in Orlando, Florida. The site of the 2021 National Convention, August 2nd through 5th. My name is Tom Macrina, I'm ACF president, and I couldn't begin to tell you how excited I am about this convention. It is great that we're all gonna be here. For many of us, this is the first time we are meeting face to face in nearly two years. Be ready for the biggest ACF family reunion you've ever attended. This will be so much fun. I can't wait to see everybody. This year's theme is Ignite Your Passion. And that's exactly what's going to happen at the ACF 2021 National Convention. We have some phenomenal keynote speakers lined up. Cutting edge education sessions, pop-up tastings, networking, and oh yeah, we're doing it all face to face with each other. Plus, Competition is back. For the first time since 2019, ACF competitions will be in full swing with a record setting number of competitors lined up for their shot at the gold. I also want to fill you in on our collaboration with Orlando World Center Marriott. We are so pleased with the Marriott's dedication to providing the safest and most courteous environment possible for ACF members. The Marriott planning and preparation to help us follow CDC guidelines during our national convention is second to none. I can't wait for this convention to come. I'm very excited to see everyone face to face. There's competitions, there's education, there's everything. But the most important part is sitting at the bar and having a nice cocktail and relaxing. Registration for the ACF 2021 National Convention is open. So head to the events page at acfchefs.org to learn more or click on the link in this video's description. To everyone in the ACF family, please stay safe, stay healthy, and I can't wait to see you at this year's 2021 ACF National Convention in Marriott World Center, Orlando, Florida.